In this lecture, we will cover the level 1 reading on the firm and market structures. As a financial analyst, understanding the market structure in which a particular firm operates is extremely important because market structure will help determine what sort of profitability can be realized. In this particular reading, we will talk about four major market structures, perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly and monopoly. I'm sure you know this already, but let us just look at the definition of a market and this is the definition as presented in the curriculum. A market is a group of buyers and sellers that are aware of each other and are able to agree on a price for the exchange of goods and services. And as I just mentioned, here are the four types of market structures that we will talk about. These are the factors which determine market structure and I'll read these out for you. The number and relative size of firms supplying the product. Number two, the degree of product differentiation. Number three, the power of seller over pricing decisions. In other words, pricing power of the seller. The relative strength of the barriers to market entry and exit. And finally, the degree of non-price competition. Here note that we are talking about non-price competition because in all markets there will be some price-related competition. This is a summary slide and it's extremely important because it is describing the basic characteristics of the four market structures. And I would suggest you spend a couple of minutes on this and memorize the slide because there is a high probability that you see a question based on this material. Perfect competition, we have many firms, barriers to entry are low. In terms of product differentiation, the products are homogenous. This means that in general, we have similar products. Non-price competition, none. In other words, all the competition is based on price. Since the products are homogenous, all that consumers are concerned about here are price. And as we'll see later, each individual company or firm does not have any pricing power. The price is defined by the market and then each firm simply takes that price. It is useful to have an example in mind which you can associate with each of these structures. And the example that I like to think of when we talk about perfect competition is the market for oranges. Second, monopolistic competition. Here again we have many firms, barriers to entry low. The products are generally substitutes. In other words, they are somewhat similar, but they are also differentiated. In terms of non-price competition, firms advertise and they try to establish certain differences related to their product. So we can say that firms over here follow a product differentiation strategy and there is some pricing power. My favorite example of a market where we have monopolistic competition is the market for toothpaste. Number three, oligopoly. Here we have a few firms. Barriers to entry tend to be high. The products could be close substitutes or they could also be differentiated. There is going to be advertising and where there is differentiation, obviously the advertising will try to emphasize the product differentiation and firms will tend to have significant amount of pricing power. And finally, monopoly. Here we have a single firm. Barriers to entry are very high. The firm is typically selling a unique product and it's the only firm, obviously, which is selling that product. These firms or monopolies do advertise and their pricing power is considerable. The classic example of a monopoly 
would be a utility company or a supplier of electricity in a major city. With oligopoly, my favorite example is Coke and Pepsi. So the market for colas would be an oligopoly in most countries. In section three, we talk about perfect competition in detail. Here are the characteristics again. You saw these on the previous slide, so you can read them again. Demand analysis in perfectly competitive markets. The market demand curve is downward sloping. And the reason is, if we take the market for oranges, for example, consumers like to buy oranges, but if the price of oranges increases, then obviously the overall demand for oranges will go down. So if we look at the market demand curve where price is on the y axis, quantity is on the x axis, you might have a demand curve with this particular equation. Quantity is equal to 50 minus 2p. As we've seen in an earlier reading, this can be rewritten like this. Price is equal to 25 minus 0.5q. And if you were to draw this out, notice when Q is zero, then we are at 25. And if P is zero, then Q is equal to 50. So this is what the market demand curve looks like. So I'll label this market demand. Now, what does the total revenue curve look like? Remember, total revenue is simply price into quantity. We already have price over here. If we multiply this by quantity, then we have 25Q minus 0.5Q squared. So that is our total revenue function or total revenue expression. What about marginal revenue? Now here we are going to do a little bit of calculus. If you recall, marginal revenue is equal to change in total revenue divided by change in quantity. This is our total revenue expression. And if you remember from your basic calculus classes that change in total revenue divided by change in quantity means that you take the first differential of this expression so change in total revenue over change in quantity becomes over here we use 25 minus 0.5 q squared this becomes 1 times q so our marginal revenue becomes 25 minus q if you are confused about what i'm talking about here then i suggest that you listen to a khan academy lecture on basic calculus and on differentiation but this is what you get for your marginal revenue that's the market demand curve the marginal revenue curve then looks like this notice that when q is zero then the marginal revenue is 25 and when q is zero marginal revenue is 25 and when marginal revenue is zero then Q is equal to 25. So as we keep seeing, the marginal revenue curve for the market is steeper than the market demand curve. Elasticity of demand. We have seen this in an earlier reading, but we'll go over this again over here. Price elasticity of demand depends on several factors. And let me just refresh your memory in terms of what we mean by price elasticity of demand. The price elasticity of demand tells us about the sensitivity of quantity demanded to the price of an item. Here we'll assume that we are talking about own price elasticity of demand which means that the price of a particular item is reduced, for example, what happens to the quantity? For a normal good, the quantity will go up because there is an income effect and a substitution effect. But the question is, by how much? 
if price goes down by a certain amount and quantity goes up a lot then we say that this product is elastic if price goes down and quantity goes up but only by a little bit then we say that this product is relatively inelastic now what are the factors which determine elasticity here are three major factors the first one has to do with whether the product has a lot of substitutes if you think of two products a and b let's say that a has lots of substitutes and product b does not have too many substitutes which product will have a greater elasticity the answer is a because if the price of a goes up the quantity of a demanded will go down a lot because consumers will use a substitute instead whereas with b when the price goes up quantity will come down but by a little bit because we don't have too many substitutes so when there are more substitutes then the elasticity tends to be high the next point is share of consumers budget spent on a particular item if we talk about an item such as cars or automobiles these typically represent a large percentage of the consumers income versus let's say we also are talking about a product such as cereal when the price of cars goes up say by 10% the quantity demanded will come down a lot because a 10% increase in the price of cars is substantial and consumers will probably think again before buying a new car so elasticity here tends to be high whereas if the price of cereal goes up by 10% which hopefully is a small percentage of the consumer's income then a 10% increase in cereal probably will not have a big impact on the quantity demanded for this product so here the elasticity will be relatively low and finally length of time within which market schedule is being considered the point here is when we talk about a change in price let's say price going up the quantity demanded will go down but the question is are we considering a one day time frame or a one week time frame or a one month time frame and what this point number 3 is saying is that if we consider a longer time frame then the elasticity will be more let me give you a simple example let's say we are in a country where you can either use petrol or cng to fuel your car now the price of petrol let's say goes up what will happen to the demand for petrol in the short run the answer is the demand will come down but not by too much what about in the long run let's say it takes a week or two for consumers to install a cng kit in their cars so if we take a longer view say a one month view then the elasticity for petrol will be much more because in one month's time a lot of consumers will convert their cars to cng and then the demand for petrol will come down a lot more so again this is easy to see when the time period being considered is long then the elasticity will be more elastic inelastic and unitary elastic we've seen this before when we say that the demand is elastic we mean that elasticity is greater than 1 this means that a 1% change in price will cause a change in quantity which is more than 1% inelastic means that the elasticity is less than 1 and unit elastic means that elasticity is equal to 1 In exhibit 3 the curriculum gives the elasticities of several products and while you don't need to 
memorize these elasticities, but it is interesting to note that the most inelastic product shown in exhibit 3 is regular coffee, where the elasticity is only 0.16. What this is saying is that even when the price of coffee goes up, the demand doesn't change too much. And you can also see that over here. For those who love coffee, even though one might argue that tea is a substitute, but those who really like their coffee, for them, there isn't really a substitute. Coffee also is a relatively low percentage of a consumer's budget. So you can see why the demand is very inelastic. At the other end of the spectrum, we have furniture, which has an elasticity of 3.04. And this is relatively high. Here, furniture tends to be somewhat expensive. People can delay the purchase of furniture if the price is too high right now. So that has a somewhat elastic demand. And finally, perfectly elastic versus perfectly inelastic. These are extreme conditions. If you have price and quantity, perfectly elastic would mean a picture like this. And we will see this later in the context of perfect competition. Perfectly inelastic means that our demand curve looks like this, that no matter what happens to the price, the quantity demanded is the same. What are some other factors which affect demand and consumer surplus? We've talked about this before also. Movement along the demand schedule versus shift in the demand curve. The curriculum uses this term demand schedule and demand curve almost interchangeably. And I have used this term here. So if you see demand schedule, you don't get confused. It's just a way of referring to the demand function or the demand curve. If you have a particular demand curve, price on the Y, quantity on the X, a movement along the demand curve happens if only the price of that particular good and the quantity demanded change, all else remains the same. This is called a movement along the curve. A shift in the demand curve means that something other then the price and quantity have changed. For example, if the income of consumers goes up, then the overall demand curve will shift. Or if there is a change in price of a substitute or a complement, then the demand curve will shift. If this sounds very familiar, that's a good thing because in the first reading in economics, we studied this material in detail. Income elasticity of demand refers to the change in quantity demanded relative to or divided by the percentage change in income. For a normal good, this will be positive. For an inferior good, this will be negative. Cross price elasticity of demand is the percentage change in quantity demanded of a particular product divided by the percentage change in price of either a substitute or a complement. So basically the denominator refers to the change in price of some other product. Consumer surplus value minus expenditure. This entire section, including the example, is exactly what you see in this particular reading, demand and supply analysis, introduction section 3.9 so i will not repeat the material over here in fact a lot of what i've said over the last few minutes is material from this particular reading so think of it as a quick refresher 